Welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Celia. I'm director of the High Meadows Environmental Institute here at Princeton. I want to welcome all of you to the HMEI faculty seminar series. This is, in fact, the first seminar under our new name, which was announced last week. I assume most of you know about that. Uh, if you don't, or even if you do, please feel free to visit our website which, uh, which remains the same as it was before the name change, which is environment.princeton.edu. You can find much more information there about the Institute and about the name change. Uh, as we've done in uh, each of these uh, earlier uh, uh, faculty seminars that we offer in the Environmental Institute, uh, when we've done them online as we are now, we'll have a discussant for today's talk and our discussant today will be Jeff Whetstone, who is professor of visual arts in the Lewis Center and known widely for his photography and visual uh, creations, many of which have an environmental theme. And as we've done throughout the seminar, everyone in the audience is welcome to type in questions or comments. To do so, you should use the Q&A box that you should see on your screen, the chat function, on Zoom is disabled for this seminar, so please use the Q&A box. All right, uh, now I have the great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who of course is Anne McClintock. Anne is the A. Barton Hepburn Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies here at Princeton. She's also a member of the Executive Committee of the Program in American Studies and uh, a very valued, valued faculty affiliate in HMEI. Anne's work is both interdisciplinary and transnational, exploring many different and interesting themes, including the intersections among race, gender, and sexuality, imperialism and globalization, including indigenous studies, and militarization, climate chaos, and animal studies. Her work is both scholarly and creative, she has published numerous scholarly works, including several books and many academic articles. She's also published creative essays and photographs in many popular outlets, including The Nation, The Guardian, and The New York Times. Anne has won numerous awards, including two MacArthur Fellowships, the Columbia University's Distinguished Human Rights Fellowship, the Charlotte Newcomb Fellowship, the Feminist Scholars Award, and many artists' residency fellowships. Her photographs were most recently exhibited at the Chicago Architectural Biennial last year in 2019, at TBA 21 Academy in Venice this year, 2020, and at the launch of Oceans in Transformations, also in Venice in 2020. Anne continues to be prolific in terms of her output with many different projects underway, including three different books and it, at different stages uh, in terms of uh, progress. Her work has been translated into 16 languages and has been cited more than 16,000 times. Please join me in giving a very big virtual welcome to our great friend and colleague, Anne McClintock. Anne, the video is yours. Thank you so much, Mike, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you everybody for coming. It's, I'm, I'm, um, astonished and both humbled to see so many people here, especially on this extraordinarily epical day, uh, not only I think for the US, but for, for the world. But before I begin, I want to thank Mike Celia and Kathy Hackett um, as warmly as I can for the extraordinary generosity and support that you've given to me um, in, my, in my years at Princeton and, um, and your support of the environmental humanities. And I can't begin without also thanking this extraordinary team, Morgan Kelly, Hans Marcelino, and Raj Shakri. Um, what an amazing group of people it's been to, 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 to work with. So my talk today is called Monster of Hugh and Fire and Ice. And it's taken from my forthcoming book from Duke University Press. And the book is called Unquiet Ghosts from the Forever War to Climate Chaos. And so the talk um, is going to be uh, pretty brief. And so it's taken um, from fragments from the book, but I hope you can see the silhouette of the argument of the book. The talk is creative nonfiction and it's interwoven with um, 
mostly all my photographs. Just a handful of them are not my photographs. And um, as maybe we can talk about in the question time, um, some of them belong in the domain of criminality, and I can explain what that, what that is. But without any more ado, um, let me begin. Monster of fugue and fire and ice. My talk today unfolds fugue-like three of the great crises of our time, climate chaos, global militarization, and the mass displacements of people and other species. The word monster in the title comes from an era to show or warn by which gods give notice of calamity, hence monstrous, premonition, demonstration, and monument. The word few comes from fugaro, fugara, to flee from or chase, as in fleeing or chasing monsters or ghosts, hence refugee fugitive, refuge, and to fly. Fugues may appear in contrapuntal narratives or music that interweave differently braided voices. Fugues may also appear as emotional states involving amnesias, great forgettings or unburyings, where one finds oneself unexpectedly in haunted places. We have entered an epoch of shocked space and torn time. The planet is awry, we awakened oil from its ancient slumber to fuel our own fossil dreams. We combusted the deep time of the past into an alchemy of black energy. Now the ice sheets are vanishing faster than ever thought possible. Greenland is melting, the ice is leaving Iceland. Lightning torches the tundra, turning permafrost into permafire. Firestorms so vast they are visible from space rage across Amazonia, Australia, California, and Siberia. In Harare, Zimbabwe, the taps run dry. Farmers watch mile-high dust storms rub out the sky. The great burnings of the trees, the vanishing of the bees, and everywhere, the stealthy rising of the seas. But the established circuits that connect these great crises have been ghosted. How do we record a history of forgetting? How do we write a history of fragments? How do we live in fugue times? Fugue one, Refugee. This fragment is from Walton Shire's great poem called Home. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one leaves home until home is a sweaty voice in your ear saying, leave, run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. In 2015, at the height of the arrival of 500,000 displaced people into Europe, a men's clothing shop in Izmir, Turkey, began selling orange life jackets alongside its regular menswear. Izmir served as a hub for refugees, as well as a boom town for business. This photograph in the New York Times of the shop is both striking and chilling in how nonchalantly the shop window stages a false equivalence between the models on the right wearing orange life jackets and the identical models on the left wearing black and navy business jackets. As if displaced people from the global south desperately dressed for survival can, with the exchange of cash, like the man tucking his wallet in his pocket, pass through the open door of the unregulated free market economy, be rescued from calamity and instantly dressed for success. The shop window stages the false promise of global south to global north upliftment, the ethos of the free market that will raise all lifeboats. But the black hole of the rubber tube in the window on the right and the chaos of orange life jackets at the back of the store create visual disturbances that point to a spectral violence. In Ismo, the dark secret is that an illegal multi-million dollar rescue economy is booming an illegal smuggling infrastructure and factories churning out inflatable life jackets and rafts. The unspeakable secret is that the life jackets are often made from materials like foam that do not float, but instead absorb water, drowning rather than rescuing the refugees. What also interests me is that the New York Times article that accompanies the photograph is like neoliberalism itself, awash with watery words, 
migrants are flooding, a human tide is rushing, money is pooling, cash is pouring, outflows and overflows. It's a perfect storm, says Demetrius Papadimitriou, president of the Migration Policy Institute. These watery words obscure the refugee calamity, as well as the profits garnered by the pirates of pericapitalism and the overlords of austerity as a fiat of nature a tidal result of natural causes. Nature becomes thereby the alibi and accomplice of the inequities of austerity. But as Arundhati Voy notes, trickle down hasn't worked. But as she said, gush up certainly has. What the article obscures, however, is that the majority of the refugees who arrived that summer in Turkey were from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. The shattered revenants of the illegal wars of occupation that both caused and converged with the accelerating crises of climate breakdown and mass displacement. We would do well to remember that militarization is the largest single cause of environmental havoc in the world. By the end of 2019, nearly 80 million people had been forcibly displaced, 68 million by armed conflict or persecution. A person is displaced every three seconds in the world. But what I mean by displacement is not merely the violent removal of people and other species from place. I also mean displacement as quite literally the removal of place. That is loss of place in place, manifest in what I call ghost ecologies or ghostscapes. That is damaged landscapes such as melting ice caps, forest infer infernos and trees torched for palm oil plantations fraying wetlands and toxic wastelands and the rising oceans of this blue planet we are slowly undoing. Seeing displacement as both removal from place and removal of place also invites us to consider forced mobility as the spectral double of forced immobility. Millions of the global poor and dispossessed are either forcibly on the move or forcibly unable to move, incarcerated in refugee camps, detention centers, and island prisons like Nauru, Australia, webbed into the invisible surveillance systems of carceral modernity that now spread their filaments around the world. And a photograph this year in The Guardian offers an uncanny spectral double of the New York Times photograph of Izmir, revealing the failure of the neoliberal ethos of upliftment in an image of refugees in orange life jackets, now flanked by first responders in COVID hazmat jackets. Here two, premonition, ice at the end of the world, glacier, a puddle, glacier, a monsoon, a tsunami, glacier, a plaque, a siren, which is an excerpt from Jean Rose Smith's uh, cryogenics. I am flying. It's the summer of 2012, and I'm flying over Greenland. Far below lies an unearthly landscape. Something looks beautifully, surreally wrong. But what is it? Greenland's mountains are sloughing off their ancient sheath of snow. The icy tongues of the glaciers are thinning. The bony ribs of the earth are visible to the sun for the first time in 100,000 years. 2012 is the Goliath year of climate change and it is all about the ice. But one fact towers above the rest, the colossal melt of Greenland. In mid-July, scientists stared at statistics so staggering they thought at first there must be some mistake. Satellite images show that in four days alone in July, 97% of the massive mountainous surface of Greenland had melted from white to dark. Snow cover, parts of which had been frozen for 18 million years, had thawed into a colossal sheen of ice water. Scientists were stunned. Ice surface the size of the United States had simply gone. This is unprecedented, said Jay Zwally, a glaciologist at NASA. To have melt cover the whole of Greenland, he said, is unknown. A few days before the Great Melt, an iceberg the size of two Manhattans sheared off the Peterman Glacier and floated out to sea. The fraying edges of Greenland are slipping underwater. For the first time in human history, blooms of algae sprout beneath the permafrost as sunlight filters through the blue melt caverns. 
icy torrents roar down sapphire abysses called Mulans, unmaking the ice sheets from below. Panicked, polar research teams crunched the numbers and agreed. Ice melt had caused 20% of global sea level rise since 1992, and most of the melt was from Greenland. The Arctic ice domes have shrunk to their smallest size in recorded history, melting three times faster than anywhere on Earth, seven times faster than in the 1990s. By century's end, Glacier Park will have no glaciers. Iceland may well be iceless land, and the snows of Mount Kilimanjaro will be gone. Why does this matter? The ice sheets are our giant mirrors. They reflect the sun's heat in a process called albedo, and they cool the Earth. As humans overheat the planet, the white ice melts faster. And as the ice melts, it darkens, darkens and absorbs more heat. And the great thaw speeds into a fateful feedback spiral. And as the ice melts, the oceans rise. And as the oceans warm, they rise. But what filled the scientists with dread in 2012 was not merely the immensity of the great melt, but that something unforeseen and catastrophic had been set in motion that could not now be stopped. The melting of Greenland has been called the greatest geological change to reshape the planet in human history. But the great melt is abstract. Formidably vast, but far away, Greenland is the largest island in the world stretching the vertical length of the United States. Scientists tell us the ice is two miles deep at the center. They tell us this massive ice cube contains a dizzying three quadrillion tons of solid water. That is a three with 15 zeros. And they estimate that when all this ice melts, global sea level rises, I'm sorry, global sea levels might rise by 24 feet, unleashing a planetary cataclysm that will drown the coastlines and mega cities of human civilization that took millennia to make, undoing and reshaping the world. But this is magical counting. The problem is not precision. The problem is perception. These numbers speed across our eyes like a nightmare ticker tape, too fast to be imagined, too far away to feel tangible or real. Our imagination strained against the huge numbers. We can't see the scale and time of climate threat. Our senses are tuned to the intimate signs of the year's turnings, the green sunlight of spring, the soft sifting of snow, a hummingbird's wing. Our tongues can't taste the marshes turned to salt. Our fingertips can't feel the warming oceans bleaching the coral reefs bone white. And if we can't picture it, how can we act to prevent it? To get the point across, scientists tell us Greenland is five times the size of California, or if you prefer, three times the size of Texas. But if you can't imagine the size of Texas, how can you imagine three times that much? Our minds are not suited for picturing ice caps melting, the tininess of nitrogen change, and billions of people learning to lead amphibious lives. Because the future is now. But the future has arrived at different times for different people. 48 island nations are now threatened by rising seas. The Maldives are drowning. Tuvalu and Kiribati are soon to go. Climate chaos, once seen as a calamity, comfortingly far away and measured in centuries, is now measured in decades and is already endured by millions as the ordinary disasters of the everyday, whether in the black water slums of Lagos the fluid streets of Jakarta, or the drowning of southern Louisiana. On what abacus can we count the slowly melting, the invisibly rising, but not yet drowned? We are like children counting on our fingers in the dark, trying to ward off the shapeless face of something dreadful we have unleashed and that we cannot fully understand. And as my plane flies on, leaving Greenland and carbon trails behind us, Spirals of ice spin across the sea like a galaxy of spilled stars. Few three great forgettings. Snowflakes fall to earth and leave a message. That's glaciologist Henry Bader. The Arctic white domes are the keepers of the Earth's memory. Ice remembers. Ice is the custodian of deep time, sealing the past in its frozen crypts, 
far down in the jewel-sworn depths of the permafrost, ancient air is trapped in tiny ice bubbles, the same air it was when the ice sealed it. Ice captures in its crystals a unique record of the Earth's climate history. In the 1950s, the science of glaciology emerged at the same time as the Cold War, and both converged in Greenland. In August 1949, the Soviet Union exploded its first atomic bomb. The direct line of attack from the USSR to the United States ran through the ice blind vastness of Greenland. In 1952, the US military unveiled Thule Air Base, built at frenetic pace and massive expense on the Greenland ice sheet. Named after the legendary land Ultima Thule, the base was vaunted, and I'm now quoting, it was vaunted as an engineering miracle, a guardian that looks steadily over the top of the world down into Russia, unquote. As John Gertner notes, Thule's purpose was, however, neither research nor ex exploration, but rather to, as I'm quoting Gertner, to stake out a massive advantage in terms of bombs and planes and to risk victory in the coming Cold War. And some 130 miles away, hidden from the world, swaddled in howling snow and frigid isolation, lay Thule's spectral double. In 1960, the United States built a second military extravaganza, an army town called Camp Century. Camp Century was hidden in a vast labyrinth constructed entirely under the snow. Camp Century was an icy catacomb of military hubris and Western commodity culture, complete with a church, a hospital, a store, barracks, a theater, and a library containing 4,000 books. And to power all that comfort was the world's first mobile nuclear reactor, costing $5.7 million. The purpose of the camp was as megalomaniacal as its construction. To control the Cold War, the United States had to control the Northern Ice. To do so, it spawned a monstrous project called Iceworm. The ambition of Iceworm was to figure out how to secretly move 600 intermediate range ballistic missiles through a massive under ice labyrinth of hundreds of miles of tracks and roads covering an area the size of Alabama, and then target the missiles at the USSR. But to keep the ambitions of Iceworm secret, the military needed a cover. They claimed they were doing scientific research on ice. Not even the engineers knew why they were learning how to build hundreds of miles of tracks under the ice. And by unintended consequence, out of the icy catacomb of military vanity rose the visionary science of glaciology. Henry Bader, a pioneer cryologist, was driven by an enchanting vision. He was sure that ice was a frozen archive of the deep past, whose secrets were encrypted in compacted snow. If made legible by science, he believed, ice could become a miraculous code for capturing not only the recent human past, but also events before humans made records, before humans even existed at all. Bada was right, ice remembers. An ice crystal is akin to a frigid fragment of coded braille, making the deep past legible in tiny telltale breaths of time. We can now look into deep time reading traces of the Industrial Revolution, the signatures of tsunamis, past meteor strikes, and when cryologists drilled down to 1,000-year-old ice, they dropped a fragment of the ice into a glass of drambui and called it Jesus ice. With icy eyes, humans can now look into the frozen crypt of climate's past, and one monster now stares back at us, certain I certain knowledge that ancient climates had and will now again change not only gradually but also catastrophically and unstoppably fast. Fugue 4, Great Unburyings. As the world's glaciers melt, things thought forever buried under the ice are rising to the sun. In these unearthly stirrings, unburied artifacts speak in fugue time. Thawing permafrost thrusts up the corpses of reindeer, also thrusting up spores of anthrax. More ominously, 
toxic methane is rising from the melting ice. Methane has a warming effect 80 times stronger than carbon dioxide over 20 years. And only last week, scientists um, reported that what scientists call um, sleeping giants of the carbon cycle, in other words, frozen methane deposits, which are like vast toxic ice cubes, that these sleeping giants are now melting over a vast area of the Siberian coast. We, the startled onlookers at a past, thrust untimely into our present, are also finding ourselves probable heirs to giant viruses and ancient parasites, the future consequence of which we cannot fathom. Puke 5, the administration of forgetting. On April 20th, 2010, the BP Deepwater Horizon rig exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, taking with it 11 men dead. The disaster unleashed more than 134 million gallons of crude oil across the Gulf of Mexico, becoming the largest environmental disaster in US history. It also became the largest cover-up of an environmental disaster in US history. In the Gulf of Mexico, the forever war came ashore. A calamity of untold magnitude unfolded, and alongside it, a strange militarization emerged as the language for managing the crisis became the language of war. War talk fired from the media, the Coast Guard, and local officials alike. Governor Bobby Jindal said, we need to see this as a war, a war to save Louisiana. Billy Nungesa, president of the Plaquemines Parish, said, we will persevere to win this war. Political consultant James Carville said, this is literally a war. And General Russell Honore said, we need to act like this is World War III. Treat this like it's an invasion. We've got to find the oil and kill it. Visit the BP website in 2010, and you would see the word kill appear with ritualistic incantation. Kill the well, kill the leak, kill the oil. Culminating in the kill shot, and I'm not making this up, the weird slurry of car tires and golf balls that BP initially fired at the leak to kill it. As if by throwing the sacrificial detritus of our oil-soaked leisure activities into the maw of the oil god, BP could stop it spewing death. But this was truly strange talk, this talk of war and killing oil. Only a tremendous failure of the imagination could see it as a war. But since the 1970s, almost every crisis of neoliberalism has been called a war. The war of drugs, the war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on AIDS, the war on terror, and now the war on oil. But down in the Gulf of Mexico, the BP disaster fell into a great forgetting. What do I mean by that? Shortly after the blowout, an extraordinary ruling was passed. No one could go within 60 feet of oil-damaged areas. No one could go within 60 feet of barrier islands or birds or, or marshes with boom or beaches or boats. BP workers were banned from talking to any media. Scientists had to sign on to disclosure agreements. And if anyone violated the ruling, they faced $40,000 fines or felony charges. So I went down to the Gulf to see what they were hiding and why. And to get behind the blockade, I finally hired a tiny cyst of pain and took to the illegal skies. I am flying. From horizon to horizon, I see smears of pink oil stretching for miles. Telltale signs that the Gulf was being sprayed by massive amounts of the highly toxic chemical Corexit. But why? BP had agreed to pay damages for verifiable evidence. And to hide the evidence, Military planes, and I could hear them going out at night, carpet bombed five Gulf states with Corexit. But Corexit doesn't remove oil. It just sinks it out of sight. Corexit became a conjuring trick, a sorcerer's bargain with life and death. But the administration of forgetting leaves traces of what it tries to forget. Because when sprayed on oil, Corexit turns an eerie pink. Corexit's alchemy of erasure paradoxically revealed the cover-up in the very act of trying to conceal it. Reports this year reveal that the toxic effects of the BP oil disaster and the Corexit are ongoing and 30% larger than originally calculated. 
But what many people still don't know is that the militarization of the Gulf catastrophe was also a soft launch for what the Pentagon calls, and I'm quoting, a revolution in warfare. In other words, using climate emergency to justify a perpetual war. The US military sees in climate change a silver lining, a demonstration, which is an old military term for a show of force. Climate chaos is now seen as both a threat multiplier and a huge opportunity for the military. As Admiral T. Joseph Lopez puts it bluntly, and I'm quoting, climate change will provide the conditions that will extend the war on terror, unquote. Climate disaster has become a new paradigm as well for criminalizing climate justice activists who are being put on terrorist lists and levied severe prison sentences and massive fines. And down in the Gulf in Barataria Bay, the crabs climb out of the burning water and hold their claws to the sky. Boats lie still, sails are shrouds, and children cough, the BP cough. In The Great Derangement, Amitav Ghosh makes a prescient point. For most of human history, people were wary of coastlands. But in the 17th century, colonial empires unleashed what Ghosh called the Great Derangement, an estrangement from environments and a colonial complacency that was, he says, itself a kind of madness. Satisfying colonial needs to be close to colonial coastlines, future megacities like Mumbai, Chennai, not to mention New York, Boston, and New Orleans were built on fluid lands, marshlands, and deltas, an imperial folly now lay bare as catastrophic. Scientists predict that not by century's end, but during the next 30 years, an approximate 300 million people might face chronic flooding, and the brunt of the Anthropocene falls most heavily on the global poor. Take the drowning of southern Louisiana. Fugue seven, and this is the last fugue, Atlas of a Drowning World. This is the map of the forsaken world. This is the world without end, where forests have been cut away from their trees. These are the lines Wolf could not pass over. Linda Hogan, Chickasaw, her poem Map. Louisiana is the fastest disappearing land on earth. The verdant coastlands and marshes teem and royal with an astonishing abundance of birds and fish and wildlife. But every hundred minutes, a little bit longer than this talk today, land the size of a football field will vanish into open water. And deep in the fragile southern marshes, the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw cling to a vanishing shard of land called Ile de Jean Charles. I am flying. The island, once the size of Manhattan, has now frayed into, two frag into a tiny fragment two miles long and a quarter of a mile wide. When the next big hurricane, her residents tell me, the island could go, its name washed from the map forever. At my side, the island seems to be flying too, a half hallucinatory bird, its eyes pointing to the far horizon, but one wing seems caught and melt from the faraway ice caps, and the island bird breathes water. A single road tethers the island to the world, so thin and broken that when the great storms surge, the road drowns underwater, sometimes leaving the people marooned for years. The inhabitants of Ile de Jean Charles were a few years ago called the first federally funded climate refugees in the United States. What had happened was that in 2016, the state of Louisiana won a $48 million federal grant to leave, relocate them to a suburban settlement further inland, and the media of the world is waiting to see how they do it. But in talking to Chief Albert Nakan, Choctaw, and Chris and Juliet Brunet, also Choctaw, and other tribal members of the island, I found a more troubling story emerging. The island is a caught in a paradox, not only between rising waters and wanting to stay on their island, but also between being hailed as climate refugees while not being federally recognized as existing in the first place. The islanders chopped off forebears fled the 1830 Indian Removal Act, a colonial cataclysm 
during which thousands of native people were driven off their lands east of the Mississippi to territories in the West. The Trail of Tears that followed enacted a double violence against both native people and enslaved Africans as native lands were emptied to make way for sugar and cotton plantations. Some Choctaw, like the islanders of, of Ile de Jean Charles, fled the great removals and found refuge in marshes so abundant they sustained themselves alongside Chidimacha, Biloxi and Homa in peaceful solitude for nearly a century. Then in the 20s, the oil companies came. Now the islanders have been driven from their homes by the same economic rapacity that drove their ancestors off their lands. Companies drilling for oil have sliced and diced the vast wetlands into ribbons. Rigs suck out the marshes and the marshes sink. Canals draw salt water into the wetlands and the vast forests die, bleached into skeletal ghost trees. Rising waters are floating the island away. As the waters rise, the houses rise too, floating some 15 feet high. The water people are learning to lead skyborne lives. And I am learning to see ghosts everywhere the water has been and will surely come again. But some of the islanders refuse to leave. They are holding on with their fingers to the frail scaffolding of their lives. They are holding on to torn time before the high water comes, their demon lover to float everything away in its arms. They are turning their backs on the howling havoc of the hurricanes, on the politicians and the media, on the water pouring in through the final hourglass of their days. But the waters rise, seeping under the doors, filling the teacups, soaking the mattresses and floating the children away. Shrimp fisherman Russell Dowdow from the nearby island of Ponachen took me out on his shrimp boat to see the skeletal afterlife of the drowned forests. A broken, watery emptiness where, he told me as a child, he rode horses through verdant forests so lush that they hid the sun in the middle of the day. Now only ghostscapes remain. I am flying. Below me, the vast wetlands are ruined ghostscape. The islanders call these great dying forests, ghost forests, or skeleton trees. Every straight line in the marshes is man-made and a road to destruction. Every straight line dredged by the oil companies is a fatal artery that pulls salt water into the wetlands. The body of the land is hurt. Ragged strips float away like green scabs. The last tree on Island Road leans arthritically against the evening sky. And at the end of Ponachen, a statue of Christ holds out his arms. He is called Man of Sorrows. As I leave Ile de Jean Charles, a churning storm erupts. Fishermen are refusing the storm. Their bodies gleam like fish. They are fishmen, breathers of water. They are dancing an ancient slow dance. They are learning to lead amphibious lives, casting their nets of hope. But in losing Ile de Jean Charles, the world is not just losing an island with an irreplaceable community. The world is losing a life way, an indigenous ethic, an ethic of being beholden, of holding others and knowing one will, in turn, be held. Finally, Coda, Fugue Futures, Monument. Let me come to a close. Katrin Jakob Stotir, Prime Minister of Iceland, has said, human rights, social justice and gender equality are all intrinsically connected to the fight because climate change affects the poor more than the rich, the underprivileged more than the privileged, and women differently than men. In 2015, I'm sorry, in 2014, the Okjukul glacier was officially pronounced dead. A funeral was held to mourn the passing of OK. In 2019, a monument called A Letter to the Future was unveiled to mark the frozen body of the glacier as both a warning and a mourning. And the monument reads, this monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. I have come to believe that the Anthropocene invites an, inf an affinity with few futures 
that refuse the grand linear narratives of the Enlightenment modernity disguised as progressive time. Thinking through few futures invites a new, new figures and stories of collective time, multivocal and dissonant, conjoining beauty and trouble in contrapuntal complexity in which humans are only one filament. We must keep faith in fugue futures so that the past does not continue to wound the present. To read ghost ecologies only for their dark histories is simply to inflict another violence, disallowing the possibilities of resurgent life and generous beauty. Fugue time is aligned with tidal time, moon time, and almanacs, the summer looping of swallows. Fugue futures are aligned with the Earth's animacy. Given time, rocks travel, glaciers speak volumes, and forests commune in fungal whispers. As the coronavirus pandemic of 2020 has curtailed human activity, forms of resurgent life have leapt to view. The horizons of Delhi turned sky blue. Peacocks pranced down highways, penguins strutted through Cape Town. We must remember these intimations of abundant life. For as Arundhati Roy writes, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next, unquote. We must remember these flashes of emergent beauty, not as encounters that deny affliction, but as a collective imaginary of few futures where suffering is entwined with improbable beauty and the enchantment of the ordinary. I have come to believe that if we begin with what we love, we give grief and mourning their fullness. Grief makes us kin with what we mourn, and out of that kinship, radical transformation will more likely rise up. Protecting what Rachel Carson called the web of life is within our reach, not just for ourselves, but for the future strangers who will walk the future planet in our footsteps. Small acts have epical effects, and there is no act too small to make a difference. The future is now. So we must learn to speak with ghosts. The spectres disturb the administration of forgetting, and the hauntings of popular memory will return to challenge the great forgettings of official history. For as the writer Eduardo Gallano writes, history never really says goodbye. History says, see you later. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was fantastic. Uh, my job now is simply to turn it over to, uh, uh, to our discussion for today, as I already mentioned, uh, Jeff Whetstone, for those who arrived a bit late. Uh, uh, Jeff is with the Lewis Center here at Princeton, himself an outstanding photographer and visual artist. And some of you who are uh, veterans of this uh, series may remember uh, that he gave a talk uh, two years ago in this series, October 2018, on his own work in the lower Mississippi Delta. Uh, and uh, Jeff will now uh, take over uh, and have a conversation and moderate the questions uh, that you can send in uh, for Anne. I'll just remind you that everyone in the audience is Welcome to use the, the Q&A function uh, to send in uh, any questions or comments you might have. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and uh, Anne, wow, very powerful. Uh, I'm having, having a moment to kind of exhale, but uh, we've already got a few questions or several questions on in the Q&A. So I'm going to uh, address those since we don't have much time, but I wanted to uh, kind of start them off with my own question, which actually intersects with some of the questions that we, we've seen, especially about photography. Um, your, your photographs, there's so many different strategies of your photographs. You, you know, you can tell some are uh, maybe borrowed from those on the front line of the BP oil disaster with the timestamp on them taken by maybe a, a small pocket camera. And then there are these incredible photographs, these, these, these aerial photographs that I think you describe them as describing uh, beautifully, describing something that's beautifully surreally wrong or uh, joining beauty and trouble was what I saw in those uh, 
aerial photographs. And then there's these photographs on the ground of people, of fishermen, of sunsets. And I just wanted to um, get you to comment on how you see the photographs working, not just in this talk, but in the book. Is there, a, is there an organizing principle to your photographs in the book uh, as a whole? Right, thank you so much. Um, that's been a huge question for me. So for, uh, it's wonderful that you begin there. I, if there's an organizing principle, I discovered it rather belatedly and to much, much to my relief, which is really the, 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 the figure of the few. And so I think what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to um, envision and animate a creative and a collaborative relationship between images and words. Um, which takes the form of a fugue and which in which the images and, and uh, words are an intricate interweaving um, that where the images are not just the backdrop to the, the words and the words are not just an explication of the images, but where they mutually inform each other, they enlarge and enhance each other and they offer counterpoints, sometimes contradictory um, uh, counterpoints to each other and that out of that, um, uh, this fugue interweaving, a new collaborative um, uh, uh, form emerges that might allow, I think it's one of the things I'm, I'm extremely interested, might allow us to animate alternative pasts and thereby um, imagine alternative, uh, alternative futures. And in the book itself, um, you, you're, you're right that to, to identify that there are different, I guess, different um, different categories of photographs. The book is divided, I'm gonna say very briefly, into three fugue elements. The first is premonition, the second is monstering, and the final one is revenance. In the first, um, the first section, I'm really preoccupied with a question of um, how we can account for the planetary upheavals of the Anthropocene, and indeed the upheavals of this moment, the pandemic, and what I believe is a very perilous entry into corporate fascism. How do we account for these upheavals of this current moment without illuminating the long arc of their beginnings in the military geographies of European imperialism and invasive colonialism, the foundational violences of the onslaughts um, on indigenous people. So it begins with indigenous peoples and there are all these uncanny echoes that I cannot explain, which begin there and then loop back in this fugue way and emerge. Um, Geronimo, this boat Geronimo floats by me while I'm talking to the people on Ile de Jean Charles. Um, so there's these, all these uncanny fugue in, um, elements, but these foundational violence is, is what I began the project with. Um, genocides of indigenous peoples, centuries of um, uh, enslavement, and the violent ecocides on the environment. Um, uh, on the environment. And so, um, the beginning of the book, I look at archival images, but what interests me there is what I call the administration of forgetting. And by that, I mean the ways in which, the BP exa example is, is one example, the ways in which states and corporations um, have calculated, administered, and often very brutal ways, the amnesias by which they might try to erase the secrets of their violence. But what interests me is, is in the photographs in particular, I'm looking particularly at photographs, how these erasures leave traces of what the state tries to encrypt. And I look at Edward Curtis's images and how he's trying so hard to keep railways and, and encroachments of environment. And he literally scrubs out, it's not very well known, but I look at it and try to look at, he scrubs out of cars, he scrubs out from his images, all traces of modernity. And what I want to do and what I try to do is find those points of what I call these phantomogenic disturbances in order to read those. A, I think there's an, a responsibility and obligation and an opportunity for us to read those disturbances in order to animate these alternative pasts and alternative futures. The beginning is, I'm, I'm sorry, the middle is monstering. I look at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and also images of Hiroshima to look at these attempts to both disappear these images, but yet through our kind of techno blowback 
these images recur and almost brought the Bush administration to a standstill. And then as you've seen a glimpse of in this final section, I'm really looking, taking my own photographs and trying to counter these administrations of forgettings in a different in a different way. But as I try to emphasize at the end, really not simply to um, to revisit the violent histories of these of these broken ecologies, but also at the same time to try and animate an alternative vision. I hope I get a chance at some point in the book to write about an astonishing thing that's happening in the Gulf, which is alongside the devastation of the, the uh, Mississippi Delta, the Atchafalaya River is literally giving, giving birth to new land. Um, pristine new land. And so in that sense, the Atchafalaya River and the Mississippi Delta, and the Mississippi is desperately trying to join the Atchafalaya River. Um, it and, <laughs> and, it, and it will, and when it happens, we are, we are going to look at something epical. Yeah. Um, it's exactly that kind of fugue intertwining um, of, of improbable beauty of the Atchafalaya River alongside what I do feel we need to look steadfastly at, which is these, these um, much more troubling, um, troubling images. And at the same time, give voice to something that I know, Jeff, you've been spent a lot of time in Louisiana, the astonishing voices of the, the people who are by no means some kind of tragic disappearing people. They are some of the most resilient, extraordinary, funny, astounding people I've ever met. So I'm hoping to be able to try and give a sense of what they want me to do with my camera. So one of the things I did was I went down there is I said, what do you want me to do with my camera? And as a couple of people said to me, take every photograph you can, because with the next hurricane, it all be gone. Um, so that's a, that's a partial answer to what I'm trying to do. Well, I, I think you captured that in, 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 in some way with the, the men on the boat in the rain and um, uh, the, the, the heroic uh, nature of their gestures with the nets in the rain was, yeah. uh, is, yeah. it's, it's, it's a hopeful picture. Uh, before I get to some more questions, I just wanted to briefly ask you about uh, something that's kind of always, uh, I have this strange conflict with, with is beauty. Some of those aerial photographs, and you've said it twice in, in your talk itself, uh, are, are stunning. You say beaut beautifully, surreally wrong, and that really is palpable. And then there's another one that you said that joining beauty and trouble in, in a lyrical kind of way. Could you talk about your relationship to beauty when you're actually photographing trouble? Right. Well, first of all, to start out by saying that it was never intentional. And the, for the ones at Greenland, I was literally, sit, literally sitting in a passenger plane, I woke up from a nap, looked out the window, saw these extraordinary images, grabbed my camera, I think everybody thought I was crazy, and I just started photographing them. And I had no idea that I was photographing the Great Melt. And it was only belatedly that I figured that what I saw was something very strange. It was only afterwards that I realized, oh my gosh, and OMG is actually the name um, of, of a NASA project, which is deliberately att attempting to, to awaken people. And 2019 was the second great melt. I didn't manage to, you know, that's in the book, but I didn't manage to get into it. And the, taking the photographs themselves, when I went down in 2010, um, I want to begin with, I guess, what took, took me there, which was an image of a, of a pelican. And it was literally, some of you might have seen it, it was literally this melting blob of oil. But out of that blob of oil, there was this slowly dimming, as if a cataract was forming, that's an eye that looked out of the image at me. And I thought, I have to do something. I was not a photographer. I'd virtually never held a camera in my life. So I decided to go down to the Gulf to, um, to look at what they were hiding and why. So I was literally just putting my camera out the window and taking photographs. And in that act, something happened to me. I fell in love. And a second time when I went up and I had seen these strange devastated areas. And um, so I kept going back and I asked the pilot if he would take me to see them. And he said, that's what you want to see? And I said, yes. And when I came out, I was literally hanging out the window, uh, with my seatbelt around my knees. And when I came back, I thought it was just from the wind, but I realized that I'd been crying. So one of the things I'm extremely interested in and exploring in the book is the question of trauma. 
Um, and what kinds of trauma? How do we mourn a tree? How do we mourn a marsh? Because he turned to me and he said, people do that. And I think partly what I was doing was I was seeing the beauty, the astonishing, roiling, extravagant richness of this immense ecosystem of the Mississippi Delta, but I was also seeing the damage. And in a strange paradox, people have asked me this about it, the question, people sometimes question, what does it mean to fly? Um, are you complicit in, in various forms of military, um, um, military, militarized forms of flight? And I found it was exactly the opposite. In an odd way, paradoxically, the distance that I got physically from the, from the earth, it became more intimate to me. And I felt it as a living body. I felt I could reach out the plane and literally touch this green fur um, of the land as it was floating past me. And so I didn't intend to set out to do this. It's how it opened to me. When I saw this, it was as if my, my, my ribs had blown open, my heart had blown open, but I could also see the damage. And I don't feel what I haven't caught yet, what I want to try, is try and capture the double vision of um, these astonishing people who are talking to me and so generously admitting me into their lives, that they can literally see, they literally remember. What I'm looking at is this waste, this, this, it's beautiful, but it's, there is this uncanny, eerie wasteland. And I'm writing now about the ghost trees. But they remember these astonishing, arch uh, sort of almost like cathedrals of these great live oaks, which blot out the sun and are, are, are hosts to bald eagles and herons and an immensity of life. So um, that's what I'm trying to capture. And I'm interested in trauma. I'm interested in the notion of grief in waiting. Um, the grief of having to wait for the next hurricane and not know whether when you return, your, the home, your island is gone. Um, but at the same time, the, 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 the grief of the loss of what is, of the, immediate, the, the imminent loss. When I asked Juliette Brunet, what will you miss when the island is gone? What about the island? And she said, it being there. It's gone. So how do you capture that kind of radical, that radical loss? Mm. I love how you connect so many things together, war and in the environment, personal grief and home. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I want to just ask a, a few questions from the audience. This one's come from Pakistan and interesting question. First of all, does the environment have its own cultures? What are they? Do these cultures have contact zones? What sort of zones are these? Um, this, uh, this participant goes on to describe, you know, his culture and um, uh, as, as, you know, seeing and being unfair to the um, environment, but what are the contact zones of the environmental culture? Absolutely. Oh, that's an absolutely beautiful question. Thank you so much. Um, please get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is something I, both I and I think there's been a resurgence of interest in this. And so let me maybe pull on one strand. As I mentioned, I'm writing an, a kind of follow-up piece to Monster, which is called um, Ghost Forests, Atlas of a Vanishing World. And I'm exploring the trees as a figure for precisely to answer this kind of question. And there's an enormous amount of extraordinarily generative work being done, not only on what you see as the surface of trees above, above the ground, but what you see the entangled life in to borrow Merlin Sheldrake's world, uh, words, the entangled life underneath. And um, uh, Suzanne, um, uh, the, the notion of the world why the wood wide web has emerged, um, new understandings of the fungal whispers and that are connecting trees. And I think one of the most important things about that to, to go back to this question is that people are asking, are these communities? Um, and are seeing that, that in the history of 
of much of um, European iconography, you think of the cover of Hobbes' Leviathan, the Leviathan, the, the sovereign, is standing literally on the frontispiece of the original edition, is literally looking over a denuded forest land. The trees have been cut down. And so either trees that civilization is the deforestation, or you see epic individual trees. And what I think is emerging is the notion of trees as having their own communities and a displacement of the idea of the Scala Natura, a displacement of the idea of humans as the apex creatures on the planet. That's been quite long in the making, but I think what we're not, and I'm teaching a course called Empire of the Ark, um, in which we are exploring questions of animal community, animal communication, and instead of having a hierarchy, but rather looking at a matrix of these entangled, enmeshed communities. My answer, quick answer would be yes, I do think um, that trees have communities and cultures. Certainly, we're finding many animals, many birds. Um, humans for, for centuries have tried to um, distinguish it to exceptionalize ourselves by either we have language or we have tool making or we have shelters and one by one those we've had to shed them <laughs> and I think what we're having to do is join in with the earth's animacy and see ourselves in a more humble light and at the same time acknowledge the acknowledge the kind of damage that we're doing to these invaluable uh, communities and how dependent we are on these communities. Well, maybe you just answer, I guess, what will have to be the final question. I'm sorry, so many great questions, but I want to I'll leave with one uh, a question that's short and brief. You might have just answered it, but um, can you please give us examples of small acts that you referred to uh, in the end, of small acts that we can do either spiritual, mentally, or physically to turn the tide? Yeah, absolutely. And I think when people, sometimes people after a talk like this say, where's the hope? Where's the hope? Mm -hmm. And I would rather ask it as a different question, which is because sometimes hope you can feel, well, if there's hope, maybe I don't have to do anything because it's hopeful. And it can lead to a kind of acquiescence and apathy, but not necessarily. Instead, I think hope doesn't necessarily give rise to action, but action gives rise to hope. And I'm more particularly interested in strategies. What are the strategies for action? What strategies might actually help us um, um, save this, what Rachel Carson called the precious web of life? And I do think small acts have epical effects, which is somewhere to, to touches on chaos theory. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's in our own hands, our actions, and I, that's why I think we do need to begin with love. But I want to give a couple of examples so maybe people can go away with a sense of the power um, of images. And um, around the world right now, I think um, artists, um, musicians are gathering to try and make these sometimes, as I said, the problem is sometimes perception. These perhaps seems far away and intangible upheavals to give voice to them, bear witness to them. Um, in ways, I'm thinking of Anaudi's extraordinary video on um, in Norway where he play, sits on a piano in the midst of this chaos of ice and in a fugue-like way, his piano mingles with the, um, um, the clinking and the, the chinking and the percussive roar of the um, the melting, um, the melting glacier behind them. So the act can be as simple as playing an elegy on an ice flow. Um, on the other hand, there are documentaries like Blackfish, which um, uh, uh, had an, in, which was on the cruelties at SeaWorld, and it um, had an enormous impact. That documentary, I think, points to the power of images, not to numb or to uh, or to paralyze. I don't really believe images do that. I think rather um, militaries and corporations wouldn't be in the business of trying to censor these images if in fact the images didn't have this extraordinary power to evoke emotions and to inspire action. And Blackfish is one example where SeaWorld lost millions of dollars and it, 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 it um, inspired a lot of people to take action. Um, there's the film Under the Dome which was about um, climb, uh, air quality. Um, and it was started so simply by a journalist because she had a daughter. And that was watched by, in the first 24 hours, 150 
million people. So the small act of standing on a stage and trying to talk about air pollution, 150 million people watched it in 24 hours and 300 million people watched it in four days. And China thought that so dangerous, it censored the film. And so I think it's in the censoring of these images like BP that we actually can validate the power um, of, these, uh, of these images, be they small or be they on a global front. And the final point I want to make, which is I see in the social media, an enormous sense, both a strategy, the social media, it's a perilous medium for sure. We're seeing that happen. We're seeing it happen today. We're seeing it happen every day in the United States. The erasure of scientific data, which I think we need to counter at all costs. Um, but that what we're seeing is that the social media have become, has become a kind of global microphone, which is giving voice to disenfranchised voices, indigenous people and teenagers who knew teenagers, um, people around the world, um, voices that the cultural gate, gatekeepers of more established venues heretofore were able to silence. Um, the corporations are trying to silence activists with really scary, leveraging very scary um, uh, fines and uh, pr prison sentences of up to 10 to 20 years, putting them on terrorist lists. But the social media, I believe, is a new medium that is allowing people to, the courage is contagious and is allowing people to, to, uh, to, to, to unite. And we're seeing it happening, uh, we're see it, seeing it happening um, uh, every day. Well, uh, I hate to jump in here and, uh, and be the one to, to end this incredible discussion. Um, but we're also respectful of everyone's time. We've gone a little bit over time, but uh, I really didn't want to cut this off because the discussion to me was just so fascinating. Um, there are a number of uh, comments and questions in the Q&A for those that we didn't get to. I know Anne has already told me that it's okay for me to tell you to feel free to reach out to her, send her an email. Um, she'll also be seeing the, 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 the very nice comments and the terrifically interesting questions that l literally came in from all over the world. Um, so uh, with, with that, I, I, I want to, uh, uh, to thank uh, Jeff and especially Anne for an absolutely terrific presentation. Um, I think this is an example of uh, the High Meadows Environmental Institute and its commitment to uh, try to embrace all disciplines across the campus because we recognize that without that embrace, we have no chance to solve these big problems. With it, I think we have a chance to do it, but we really all have to be uh, working together from many disciplines. And, and this is just an example of terrific work um, that I think can really help very much in that regard. So uh, thank you both very much. To the audience, thank you so much. We still have well over 100 people here, and I think we could go on for another hour and keep the audience, but, uh, but that's not possible right now. So uh, thank you all very much. I'll remind everyone that we have this uh, faculty seminar series uh, the first Tuesday of every month. Uh, you'll see we go through a number, of, a broad range of topics. And the next one in the series will be the last for the fall semester will be a talk by uh, Professor Jonathan Levine from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And that will be on Tuesday, December 1st. I hope you'll all join us. Thank you again to both Jeff and Anne, and I look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. <laughs>